Dr. Perso, thank you so much for um, this opportunity to interview. Just quickly, um, I uh, your news is some of the the most interesting I think at Croy this year, and I was lucky to hear some of the early results at the NIH Cure oh, meeting. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's it's in the news, and there's a, there's quite a bit of controversy. But I wonder if you could just tell the listeners here briefly what you found in your study, just yeah. quick in a so, synopsis. Yeah, so so this is exciting for us. I mean, I, it's a proof of Concept. It's our first case, we believe, of well-documented HIV cure in which an infant who was uh, diagnosed with infection based on standard like laboratory criteria was infected, was started on antiretroviral therapy really for prophylaxis, but then because infection was diagnosed so early, before a week of age, uh, the pediatrician at University of Mississippi Medical Center, Dr. Hannah Gay, who's involved in this case, was able to continue the antiretroviral treatment regimen from the very early weeks of life, and that was continued until about 18 months of age when the child was um, lost to follow-up for about five months and upon return to uh, clinic at 23 months of age was told that the antiretroviral drugs had been discontinued and at that time a repeat viral load done to just sort of see where the child was with respect to control of heart virus. The viral load came back as undetectable. And even a second repeat value came back as undetectable. And standard uh, tests, such as antibody tests that we use to identify whether an infant who's older than 18 months of age is infected or not, that also came back negative. And even the DNA that's used for clinical testing in infants came back negative. So at that point, the pediatrician contacted Dr. Lizuriaga at University of Massachusetts um, Medical Center to get her assistance with respect to whether she should restart antiretroviral therapy or not. And my lab is um, focused on looking at viral reservoirs or these uh, viral hideouts in um, HIV-infected patients, but patients who are under heart. And in those patients, we can readily cover, and children specifically, we can readily recover infectious virus from cells of children who are infected. And in this case, in this infant who had stopped antiretroviral therapy, Using our ultra-sensitive culture assays, we were unable to detect the presence of virus within this child that's capable of replicating or being infectious. Mm -hmm. um, we also did additional studies. Dr. Luzariga looked to see whether the child had HIV-specific immunity. Maybe that's what's controlling mm -hmm. the virus. And there was no detectable HIV-specific immunity mm -hmm. to kill infected cells. We looked to see if the child had any protective genetic alleles, so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that there are no to confer um, the lead controller status, mm -hmm. and we did not find that. We also looked to see maybe this child's cells were resistant to HIV. Maybe it's a Delta 32 right. um, homozygous, the and had. the child was not uh, okay. Delta 32 homozygous. So, it, again, this is a single case. We believe that, um, obviously, if we had sequences or material from the time of birth to really confirm the viruses and in the mom and the baby were the same. That would be the definitive proof of clearance, but I think mm -hmm. we have sufficient laboratory evidence that this child had persistent virus in the blood for at least the first uh, 19 days of life. Right. That's a long time to have virus in the blood for it to be due from contamination or Right, sure, sure. Um, uh, passive transfer of blood from the mom. And so we believe this is the first case of well-documented um, functional cure that has important implications for very early therapy in infants if we can replicate these findings mm -hmm. and certainly will be a game changer for pediatric treatment and towards achieving cure for children who currently face a right. lifetime of therapy. And also ad additional lessons learned for the overall field of cure That's research. That's correct. For That's adults, uh, I think this has a lot of implications. Yeah. Um, how is the uh, mother and child now? How are they today? And so are they the, still being followed? So, yes. Yeah, so according to the pediatrician, the child is, is doing well. Um, I'm not sure that the pediatrician has actually, the pediatrician hasn't told me how the mom is. From what I last heard, she was doing 
okay from a medical standpoint. And I think one last thing is one of the things that this uh, told me when I heard your, mm -hmm. your first presentation was the state of care in the U.S. and how people fall out of care, especially pediatrics. I wonder if you could say anything about that. Well, I think what it reflects um, is that life is chaotic for a lot of families and that health care is not the top priority. I think, you know, daily living and it is the top priority. And I don't know if you've ever gone to these clinics, the, the wait time, and it, it's a full morning out of work to make these. Not that you should not show up for appointments, but right. I think, you know, it's five months. You know, usually the follow-up is every three months if a child is stable. Right. But I think what what this speaks to is how engaged the University of Mississippi is in, in the care of yes, their patients, yes. that they recognize this child had not shown up for care and brought her back to care. Care. And I think the, the pediatricians and the care providers there should be commended that the child did not just fall through the cracks and, and disappear out of health care. So while it sounds dramatic, you know, lost to follow up, it's five months in the grand scheme of, of life. And I think we have to be considerate of how hard life is sometimes yeah. for families to be able to make sure. it to these appointments. Sure. Well, we look forward to uh, further developments. Well, in thank this you area. for it's talking with exciting. me. Thank okay. you.